So I'm Andy Agathangelo. I'm the founder of the Transparency Task Force. Uh, we are a certified social enterprise, which means that we exist to make an impact, not to make a profit. We have a formal mission statement. Uh, our formal mission statement is to promote ongoing reform of the financial services sector so that it serves society better. So that, I hope, gives you a bit of a feel for what we are all about. Uh, tonight's session is remarkably important. Uh, as you will know, the, uh, the topic is turning the tide on dirty money. This idea that the financial services sector is awash with dirty money is a long established idea. It's not just some notion that's been dreamt up somewhere. There really is a great deal of evidence to suggest that there is a tremendous problem in relation to dirty money. And I'm going to actually uh, share my screen to bring a couple of points to life uh, before we pass over to our first speaker, Lord Prem Seeker. So um, first of all, I'm going to share with you an article. It goes back to 2016. It's from a, a journalist who at the time was spending most of his journalistic time um, uncovering the mafia. He was an anti-mafia journalist. In fact, he did that job so well, he's essentially had to keep himself under you know, protected guard ever since. So this is Roberto Saviano. And in 2016, at the Hay Festival, he came out with a very bold and strong and frankly worrying statement. He said that London is the heart of global financial corruption. And that's got to be a real worry. Whether he's right or wrong doesn't really matter. The idea that London could be a significant player, let alone the worst, is bad enough. So there really is a lot of reason to be concerned about the kind of claims that Roberto Saviano was talking about. I will put this uh, link to this particular item into the chat. Please do feel free to use the chat quite, um, quite um, openly. Of course, be polite and be courteous. Feel free to share thoughts, ideas, questions, comments, challenges, contact details if you want people to know how to get in contact with you and so on. The, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you um, a database, a resource that some of you already know a fair bit about because I speak about it quite frequently. This is Violation Tracker. It is a database that captures infringements against US authorities. There is uh, some startling information within this database. The first thing I'd like to stress is that when you click on the Industry Totals button, as I've just done, it shows you that the financial services sector has more infringements and penalties against it for a very long list of violations than any other industry, than any other industry. But not only is it actually uh, the worst offender, it's the worst by a very, very long way. The sum total, these are records going back to the year 2000, the sum total, ladies and gentlemen, is over $333 billion. Now, just to put that into perspective, the second worst offending industry, as you can see, is pharmaceuticals. They come in with 71 billion. So look at the massive gap between first and second place. In fact, financial services is so bad that if you add up industries two, which is pharmaceuticals, three, which is oil and gas, four, which is motor vehicles. In fact, every single one of these other industries, if you add them all up, when totaled, all of the other 50 industries equate roughly to the sum total of financial services. So the evidence would suggest, ladies and gentlemen, that the data speaks to the idea that there is something particularly bad and rather worrying about the financial services sector. And to make it worse, 
a lot of the brands that are particularly um, egregious are major household brands. Uh, the very worst offender is Bank of America, over $82 billion worth of fines. The second worst is JP Morgan Chase, $35 billion. Citigroup, third. Wells Fargo, fourth. So on, so forth. And when you scroll down and look at the data in a bit more detail, you start to notice a pattern. The same organizations, often banks, carry on doing the same things, even though they are fined very heavily for what it is they are doing. And we think this speaks to the idea that there is recidivism within the financial services sector. And if you want to, and again, I'll provide links to this in the chat, you can dig a little bit further. Let me show you. Um, there's a really powerful search function called offense types. Can you see it here, offense types? If you click on that, you get a very, very long list of different offense types, alphabetical A to Z, as you can see. And there's probably 11 or 12 searches within this database that are relevant to the topic of turning the tide on dirty money. For example, let me go to this one here, accounting fraud or deficiencies. We click on accounting fraud or deficiencies, and we see all these organizations, including some rather well-known names, again, JP Morgan Chase, AT&T, Marsh McLennan, et cetera, General Electric, having been caught out for major accounting fraud uh, and deficiencies. Another quick example, I won't go through all 15 or so of these very good examples. I'll put the link in the chat to save us all a bit of time. But another very good example is anti-money laundering. So let's go to anti-money laundering, if I can find it. I think I've momentarily lost it. Here we go. Offense types, um, anti-money laundering deficiencies. This is going to be interesting. JP Morgan Chase. There we go, ladies and gentlemen. We can say, as a matter of fact, that JP Morgan Chase has had a total of $2 billion, $161 million dollars worth of fines against it for the penalty of anti-money laundering deficiencies. I don't think they're going to be too proud of that. Uh, let's go to another one because we might as well while we're here. Um, banking violations we could go to. We could go to um, uh, campaign finance violations. We could go to, hey, let's go to, I'll tell you what, let's go to foreign uh, foreign corrupt practices. That sounds rather interesting. Let's have a look at foreign corrupt practices. E E E F F F F F. Foreign corrupt practices. <clears throat> Goldman Sachs. Top of this one. The worst offender in relation to foreign uh, corrupt practices. Fines approaching three billion dollars. And look at these other rather well-known household name brands in different parts of the marketplace. Um, this really does speak to some significant uh, problems. Let's go to fraud, a nice very general term. Fraud, that's pretty serious. What happens if we click on the fraud? What do we get? We get the top 10 offenders, Purdue Pharma, Wells Fargo. There we go, Wells Fargo. <clears throat> HSBC are in the top 10 as well, fraud. Um, so on and so forth. There's another one. This will be interesting. Kickbacks and bribery. <clears throat> Again, hyper relevant to the topic of tonight's conversation. Kickbacks and bribery. IJK, kickbacks and bribery. Olympus, Novartis, Merck. Look, JP Morgan Chase are in there as well. Kickbacks and bribery. We can go on and on. Uh, uh, there's, there's about 12 or 13 classifications here uh, which really do speak to the topic of um, dirty money in the financial system. There's just one more I'm going to quickly show you, which is money laundering. I think this is a very, very important one for tonight's topic. So allow me to share you, with you a little bit more of information about that. We go to the offence type section. We go to money laundering. And remember, folks, 
this isn't alleged money laundering. This isn't rumors of money laundering. This isn't conspiracy theories around money laundering. This is hard facts. Yeah. Every one of the um, many, many thousands of records in this database is actually um, a, 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 an official document of some time, of some kind. Uh, Julius Baer Group, 79 billion. And that speaks to, um, yeah, sorry, $79 million worth of fines. If you click on it, you'll get to the actual individual case details and the surrounding notes. So please do spend some time within the Violation Tracker database. It's the best thing I've come across yet in relation to, um, in relation to this kind of evidence and this kind of information. And with a sense of great pride, I'm going to show you a press release that we issued in March. Um, a joint press release in conjunction with the people that make Violation Tracker, a wonderful NGO. Oh, oh. A, wonderful, a wonderful NGO based in uh, Washington, D.C. So here we go. This is the TTF website. Um, press release dated 25th of March, announcing the intention of Violation Tracker coming to the UK, a UK equivalent of Violation Tracker. And I'm extremely pleased and proud to tell you that that is happening uh, between work carried out by the folks in Washington, D.C., with a bit of help from us as well at the Transparency Task Force. Violation Tracker is coming to the UK and we are having dialogue with various parties about getting Violation Tracker into mainland Europe as well. And I can tell you that over a three week period in November, you me? Yeah, a three week period in November, we have nine rollout meetings on Zoom, launching the UK equivalent of the database that I have just been showing you. Now, I really do hope that that sets the scene nicely. Uh, I am absolutely convinced, ladies and gentlemen, that the topic we are speaking about tonight is profoundly important to the well being of society, to economic stability to political stability. I simply do not believe we as society can have the financial services system that we want if we have a financial ecosystem globally that is very simply riddled with various different kinds of dirty money. This is important stuff. And we are going to be hearing from some wonderful speakers tonight. I am flattered by the quality, uh, the calibre, uh, the integrity, the experience and the insights that our speakers are going to be bringing to today's session. Uh, everything I've shared as a, uh, as a link with you, I'll be putting in the chat. We'll also be circulating the chat notes. There'll be a follow-up email later on as well. So don't worry if you don't catch it all. We're also, as you know, recording tonight's session and the video recording will be out on social media in the next uh, week or so. I really do hope that sets the scene nicely. It's with enormous pleasure that I invite our first speaker, uh, Lord Premaseeker, who has a, a mountain, a treasure chest, a, 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 a cavern of insight into this topic to share with us tonight. Uh, Lord Premaseeker, we're all very, very grateful that you've set aside some time for us. Can we please show our appreciation to Lord Prem Seeker and invite him to take the say, so to speak, and share with us his insights on this topic of turning the tide on dirty money. Thank you very much indeed, Prem. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you, Andy. And it's my great pleasure to return to TTF and uh, also to thank everyone for the wonderful work that you're doing. I'm very honored today to join your very distinguished panel which includes Anthony, Duncan, Shea, and Natalie. Uh, uh, Natalie and I have occas occasionally joined forces in the House of Lords to give the ministers a hard time, and hopefully we will do that uh, again soon. As you indicated, money laundering is a, it is a process which is largely invisible. Those who participate in it do not volunteer information so, in, so some of the data has to be teased out, some models have been built, and perhaps globally, it is estimated around two to 5% of global 
GDP is really dirty money. It is slushing around, perhaps could be even more. UK various models estimate has at least around a hundred billion pound of dirty money. Of course, no taxes are paid on that and very few people, if any, mostly intermediaries, accountants, lawyers, estate agents, art dealers, they are the kind of big intermediaries who really uh, profit from this. The 100 billion pound or so, uh, hello, oh, can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah. The, the 100 billion pound or so, indeed, almost all of the money laundering uh, monies relate to some kind of theft, organ trading, slavery, tax dodges, bribery, corruption, which generally we call illicit financial flows. These illicit financial flows affect everybody. For example, they create bubbles in the housing market, and lots of people simply can't just get on the housing ladder because the dirty money is simply being cleansed by buying up property. It is being used to create bubble in the securities market, being used to create bubble in the arts market. And also now, from what I read, at least in the press, in the food, in the food fuel and entertainment market as well. So it is affecting everybody. It is used to fund the narcotics trade, arms trade, slavery, and many other nefarious uh, practices. Uh, money laundering is also being used uh, to provide donations to political parties. It conceals the origins of the money, and uh, pretty soon we will have a debate in the House of Lords about it, and I will name one person uh, who used, uh, well, one person who's pretty well known and who I investigated in, the, in yesteryears for radio and TV. Uh, programs, so I will possibly name that person. And money laundering is also a threat to national security. Just to read you uh, a quote from the Parliamentary Intelligence and Security Committee's report on Russia, it said that the easy mobility of capital, which is essential for money laundering, light touch regulation, which is again essential, and appeasement of finance industry, poses dangers to national securities, and it said the system provides, and I quote, ideal mechanisms by which illicit finance could be recycled through what has been transferred to uh, what has been referred to as the London Laundromat. Okay, London Laundromat. That is what the uh, parliamentary report on Russia refers to. Of course, you don't just have to refer to Russia. You can refer it to many other countries too. And uh, for a long, long time, large amounts of money uh, have been sucked out of places like Nigeria. Sunny, General Sunny Abacha stole billions and large part of that ended up in London and still has not really been returned. So what are the major issues? There are many, I will just identify a few. Firstly, it is very easy in the UK to form a company. And companies basically give you a front, they provide secrecy, they provide legitimacy. Anyone from anywhere in the world can form a limited liability company in the UK. Shareholders don't have to be in the UK, directors don't have to be in the UK. And for public limited companies, you need two directors. Only one of that needs to be a natural person. The other person can be another company in an offshore tax haven. So that means it is almost impossible for the UK government to, to enforce UK laws on, on a director who may well be in, in, in the Ukraine or Latvia or somewhere else. And, uh, and that the government continues to promise that it will change, but so far little has actually changed. When challenged about the company's house operations, the minister said in parliament, and I quote, Companies House does not have powers to verify the authenticity of company directors, the secretaries, and registered office addresses. So what the hell is it there for? If you don't know who the real persons are, it is almost impossible to enforce any of the laws. 
shareholders do not have to reveal their true identity and it is never really authenticated. And besides, there are plenty of accountants and lawyers acting as nominee shareholders and also as uh, nominee directors. So you never really get to know. And when asked in parliament, I asked that question, the minister said, the, the government has no plans to introduce legislative proposals to prohibit nominee shareholdings. That means you cannot win the battle against illicit financial flows. You're not even at the starting block. And all this huge amount of money we are investing in regulatory apparatuses does not really give us the result, perhaps, which it should. Okay. So, and there is actually very poor accountability of corporations all around, not just small companies, even large ones. I'll look at their accounts and it is very, very difficult to figure out what's going on. And of course, the damaging bits never really appear in the accounts anyway. They are, they are sanitized out. Then there is a huge problem about the trusts. Trusts are almost impossible to penetrate. There is no universal register. And we don't really know what kind of assets they control. And that again makes it very, very uh, difficult. There is a illicit financial flows industry and it is very big in the UK. It is made up of banks, made up of lawyers, made up of accountants. And earlier Andy referred to the, uh, to the violation tracker and referred to a few banks who are uh, involved in this and little actually seems to happen to them. Uh, they pay fines, fines have just become cost of doing business. They, are, they just become a cost and they are really passed on to, uh, just really passed on to the customers in various fees. Same as accountancy firms, if they get fined for something, all just that means is their cost basis has increased and they simply pass it on. There are no personal penalties on bank directors, accountancy firm partners, lawyers, they don't go to prison. They don't pay 50% of the fines at least. So the pressure points for dealing with the things are very, very weak. So my argument is that large sums of money cannot be moved or concealed without the active involvement of accountants, lawyers, and other financial experts. That is what the, what the people often say are the enablers. Again, the parliamentary Russia report says, and I quote, lawyers, accountants, estate agents, and PR professionals have played a role willingly or, unwit or unwittingly, wittingly or unwittingly. Okay, so they are uh, involved. And if we look at the uh, things like the Panama Papers, Paradise Papers, HSBC leaks, Mauritius leaks, Jersey leaks, you will always see that there is an involvement of these professionals uh, in, in these matters. Accountancy firms, which has, uh, which has interested me for a long time, accountancy firms have long been involved in illicit financial flows. Not so long ago, a joint report by HM Treasury and the, Ho and the Home Office said, and I quote, accountancy firms that remain attractive to criminals due to their ability to use them to gain legitimacy, create corporate structure or transfer value. And some of those accountants involved in money laundering cases are assessed to be complicit or willfully blind to money laundering risks. It is within the government power to deal with these things. That is what the governments are there for. But nothing is really done. So there have been numerous judgments against uh, numerous judgments in courts in which the judges have said that the tax avoidance schemes designed by big accountancy firms are unlawful. Yet not a single one has ever been investigated, disciplined or fined. So again, the pressure points are not there. If taxes are dodged, whether they are avoided or evaded, that is part of really the uh, eventually the illicit financial flows. So actually, if anything, the government rewards the enablers. You would have noticed recently billions of pounds worth of COVID related contracts given to big accounting firms. So rather than getting them to behave, 
they actually get uh, rewarded. So the government is the biggest spender in any economy, and it can discipline people by simply saying, okay, uh, we do not consider you to be a fit and proper person for whatever reason, and therefore you will not get any public contracts. But it does not actually uh, do that. In 2013, just a reminder, the government introduced what it called tax compliance and procurement rules. The idea was that uh, generally contracts will not be given to somebody who's involved in tax avoidance or any other illicit financial flows. But uh, people are required to self-certify to say whether in the previous six years they have not complied with the tax laws. Self-certified, who's going to say uh, that I've been engaged in some illicit practices? Nobody's going to say, and needless to say, uh, nobody's really been caught out by those rules. I asked uh, in Parliament a question about up-to-date information. The government would not reveal any. Okay, so we don't even, they don't even want to tell us if somebody has self-certified. We also need to look at so-called tax havens. But let me add a caveat. UK itself is a tax haven. UK itself facilitates secrecy. It is very high on the Financial Secrecy Index published by uh, tax justice networks. So UK itself is not some haven of transparency, which uh, the, sometimes the media and the politicians would lead us to believe. Okay, So UK has legal and moral duty for good, to provide good governance of UK Crown dependencies and overseas territories, but it often does not really do that. And it has failed to do that. So recently we had a debate in parliament about uh, uh, the financial services. The government's rhetoric was that it wants uh, uh, companies who make profit in the UK to pay taxes in the UK, to be open about it. And then uh, next thing we read in legislation is that government's authorizing financial service companies operating from Gibraltar to sell their services in the UK. What that means is the companies in, uh, in Gibraltar, customers in the UK, sales in the UK, but actually sale is booked in Gibraltar. And uh, no real accountability here, okay? So again, a issue about how we deal with uh, these tax havens. So, we also need duty to report uh, money laundering. Again, the legal aspects are, are pretty weak because as I indicated earlier, uh, there are no penal, personal penalties on violators. Companies may appoint individuals and give them responsibility to deal with the financial matters, tax avoidance, anything else, but there is no personal liability on uh, directors. And, what actually drives the illicit financial flows is our corporate governance system. If directors somehow manage to make higher profits, they get higher remuneration, higher bonuses, and they're able to pay more uh, in dividends. Shareholders smile at it and they go away. Directors get rich. Personal, uh, if there is any uh, financial fine, it really uh, just is borne by the company and most likely by the customers. Our regulatory system is pretty ineffective. I'm sure Anthony will have more to tell us about that later. Uh, UK has at least 41 separate regulators for the finance industry, at least 41. I counted, there may be more. Out of these, there are 25 dealing with money laundering. These include the FCA, HMRC, the Gambling Commission, and 22 others. And these 22 others includes the faculty office of the Archbishop of Canterbury, would you believe? Okay, the Archbishop of Canterbury is an anti-money laundering regulator. And uh, there are at least 15 accountancy related bodies. And uh, there are a number of law related, uh, legal profession related bodies as well. So other than the FCA, HMRC and Gambling Commission, the other 22 are outside the Freedom of Information Net. 
it is impossible to get any information uh, from them really. So rather than reducing the number of regulators and focusing resources, eliminating duplication, the government then created another one, okay, to oversee the professional bodies in the accountancy and legal sector. It is called the Office for Professional Body Anti-Money Laundering Supervision or, or OPBAS. So it was created in 2018. And the first thing it did was to look at the world of accounting. And if I may quote from his 2019 report, it said, the accountancy sector and many smaller professional bodies focus more on representing their members rather than robustly supervising standards, partly because they don't believe or don't want to believe that there is any money laundering in their sector, partly because they believe that their memberships will walk if they come under scrutiny. We were told, particularly in the accountancy sector, that professional bodies believed their members would leave if they took robust enforcement action. Now, that is quite an indictment. Since then, I understand the OPBAS has come under a bit of political pressure to tone down its reports. And it certainly has toned them down. But if you re read the recent one, I think came out last week, Andy sent me a link. And uh, if you read it carefully, you will still, still see that the problems are there. Of course, professional bodies have no independence whatsoever from their members, and they are not really going to upset them because uh, they don't exist for that purpose. So any change has really been fairly marginal. Now, of course, lots of these problems and the issues I'm referring to occur in a particular context. The UK political ethos is not really conducive to combating money laundering. All too often, the tendency is to bury illicit practices and shield economic and political elites from scrutiny and protect them. A good example of that is HSBC, which I mentioned in a couple of debates in Parliament. HSBC, as some of you would recall, was fined $1.9 billion in the US in 2010 and uh, it was also it also signed a deferred prosecution agreement, and uh, subsequently it was not prosecuted. And of course, that itself was curious how it come an organization pays 1.9 billion dollars in fine. It admits in writing that it has been engaged in criminal conduct, but no prosecution. So another U.S. committee decided to look at this. And in 2016, they published a report called Too Big to Jail, and uh, that reproduced a letter from the then Chancellor George Osborne, who had secretly written to the committee asking them to go easy on HSBC. It was too big to jail and too big to fail, and please go easy on it. Uh, the US uh, committee report also mentions a standard chartered uh, 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 in its report as well. And the report also produces extracts from correspondence with the Bank of England and the Financial Services Authority, which was a predecessor to the uh, 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 FCA. There was no parliamentary statement to say that the regulators or the chancellor had intervened at any time, neither at 2012 nor after the US House of Representatives report was published in 2016. I mentioned it in parliament, invited the minister to respond, absolutely no response, complete silence. I did that on two separate occasions, just in case the minister uh, needed to hear it again and in case he missed it, still absolutely no response. We bury these things. Bank of Credit and Commerce International was the biggest banking fraud on this planet in the 20th century. Shut down in July 1991. To this day, no investigation, nothing. Not even a parliamentary statement to explain why there is no investigation. I fought a legal battle after five and a half years, got hold of one document called the Sandstorm Report which is available online, 
And if you look at this, you will see that the, some of the people who've been involved in the fraud and money laundering belong to Al Qaeda, belong to Saudi intelligence. Some were smuggled smugglers, some was murderers, some were gun runners, all kind, you know, all kind of people who, who should really be exposed. But the government reaction has really been to uh, uh, cover it up and basically provide new information. So in, in, the, in the few examples and the few issues that I have raised, I think you get the idea that UK is a long, long way off target from being able to combat any kind of illicit financial flow. Our political structures are very poor, our regulatory structures are poor, our enforcement is poor, and that is how it goes on. I won't say much more uh, about banks. Uh, I'm sure Anthony would want to say a bit more about banks later on. So thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, Lord Seeker, once again, you have uh, provided a wonderful, uh, rich uh, catalogue of talking points for us to pick up and run with. Can we, first of all, folks, please show our appreciation once again to Prem Seeker. Thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you very, very much indeed. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to kick off with questions, if I may, uh, uh, Prem, and, and then we'll open up to others, of course. Um, it's impossible to listen to you speak, Prem, without coming to the very worrying conclusion that the government is not trying very hard to solve this problem. Um, it, it seems to me there are so many things that could be done to help fix the problem that I come to the conclusion that the government's not trying very hard. Um, is that a fair assessment? And if, if it is, why? What is the lack of motivation? I mean, if we were talking about a house, you know, we're talking about a house in this context. Allow me to stretch my analogy here. We're talking about a house with a, a pretty serious subsidence problem or a pretty serious dry rot problem or raising damp problem. You'd, you'd worry about it and you'd fix it. You'd do all you could to stop it corroding the overall integrity of the building over time. You know, if it was a car, you'd get it repaired. But the government appears to be allowing this problem just to continue at infinitum i think i'm right in saying and i know anthony would know a lot more than this i think only about one percent of police resources are being used to combat fraud so is the government trying hard enough could it do better prem what do you say to that well i think uh, certainly can do better but i think you've got to look at it many many of the chancellors have been have links with the city and the finance industry and the banking industry, and you wonder, uh, you know, whether they can really stand back and look at the problems. I think uh, there is kind of a cognitive capture. Their oh, judgment, their sympathies lie with the industry, and this is the kind of this kind of a laissez-faire attitude. Or well, these people are generating jobs, but actually they are destroying jobs. Uh, Yes. So, so I think the government can certainly do better. But I think in, in some ways, this also tells a story about the about uh, the ineffectiveness of Parliament as well, tells a story about the in, ineffectiveness of our regulatory system. So we produced a paper for the last Labour leadership, not the current one, where we had recommended that each regulatory body should have a supervisory board made up of stakeholders. So in other words, they are in and their job is simply to supervise the executives running, whether it's the FCA, the Gambling Commission or any other regulatory body, and to see whether they are meeting some public interest objectives. Yeah. And uh, needless to say, the government uh, was not keen on that in, in any way whatsoever. So we need to, you know, when, when you ask these regulators, what do you do? The standard response I got in the work, in the research I did, was we are there to serve the public interest and protect people. Then you ask question, uh, where are the people on your structures? They will refer to some odd committee or some odd consumer panel, which is what the FCA referred to. We have consumer panels. Well, no, they don't have a power to direct executives or fire them if they are ineffective. So we don't really have the structures. And I think the government does its best 
to cover up things. And the example I referred to, HSBC and BCCI, a lot of that came from the US, where perhaps uh, some of the regulatory structures are more robust than ours. Mm -hmm. And of course, when I speak to Americans, they think their structures are pretty bad. But I usually say to them, well, look at it from our perspective. They are even worse. Uh, so, yeah. so governments can do better, and I think this should be a major issue. But I think a lot of journalists are disarmed. Oh, well, it's a complex issue. It is a technical issue, which is an argument often put forward by those who engage in illicit practices, because mm -hmm. that's a way to disarm people, to say it's complex, it's technical, you won't understand it. My God, people can, you know, land rockets on the moon and Mars, and then say, my God, you can't understand how money flows. Uh, people do understand how money flows. Wow. Well, wow. thank you for such a fascinating answer. We're going to go to Paul Increasy in a moment, who I know has an interest in the regulatory framework. Um, I think I know your quote well enough, Prem, for me to read it out or say it verbatim. I think you said in one of the debates in Parliament this year, something like, um, in the UK, we talk about us having the best regulatory framework. <laughs> But for whom? You finished off, but for whom? And I thought that was a very, very interesting point that you made. Uh, thank you so much for such rich answer to that question. Pauline Creasy, please briefly introduce yourself and make your point, Pauline. Lovely to see you as always. Thank you. Thanks, Sandy. Um, yeah, I'm Pauline Creasy. Um, I'm um, working, at, I'm a co-CEO of an aerospace um, technical services business. Um, I'm also the leader of the Premier FX um, uh, claimants committee um, who are basically trying to get their money back after a 12.3 million fraud by a medium-sized um, payment services firm which was um, authorized and regulated by the FCA. Uh, it's been going on for three years. Um, on that I just wanted to make an observation and then ask you a question please Lord Seeger if I may. Um, my experience of the, of, of the financial services and fraud and, and criminal money in the last three years because this firm who stole our money uh, were operating in plain sight um, and they were able to get away with it for 12 years, amazingly, uh, because there was basically no enforcement of the actual payment services regulation, either by the regulator or by the bank. Uh, they, they both seem to have a role in not supervising. And uh, you mentioned light touch regulation, and that has been um, said to us many times that small and medium payments firms are lightly regulated, meaning that um, they're really subject to very little regulation or they have been to date. What is astonishing is that um, one of the directors who's still alive and well, and is currently head of payment services in a new payment services firm on the cloud currency platform, um, we found out that uh, from city police that he'd actually already had a conviction for fraud and had served a custodial sentence in the UK. Um, and yet um, the city police who knew a lot about, you know, our case refused to go and investigate it because the other founder was, uh, had allegedly passed away, that that was this person's father. Uh, and so you have a situation where city police knew this information, didn't want to investigate, but were allowing one of the perpetrators to go and work in a senior job in another payments firm, <laughs> you know, which just strikes me as part of the apathy uh, if you can call it that, that is going on in the financial services sector. In fact, I get the impression that the uh, most annoying or people that get treated almost like they're criminals are actually the consumers who become victims of fraud or victims or get caught up in dirty money for daring to complain. We are actually a bigger problem than the criminals themselves. That's my distinct impression after three years. So I just wanted to make that point. Uh, it's just ongoing and there's no real interest in stopping these criminals, is my impression, uh, particularly in small and medium businesses where they just seem to be able to operate, uh, you know, very easily. They're very easy vehicles for fraud. The larger firms do have some regulation, uh, but I'm sure fraud's going on there too. And then my question to you, Lord Seeger, by May, you, you have a position in the House of Lords and you can ask ministers, including uh, the Treasury, or, or you know, the, the Home Office Minister, because uh, I think the Home Office have got equally, uh, along with the Treasury, a lot to say about why this is being allowed to go on, uh, on the scale it is. You can ask questions and require ministers uh, to come and answer them, or at least to give you a written question. 
and, and if I understood you correctly, are you saying that they were actually still refusing to give you information that you were re requesting? Uh, well, first, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm really you know, sorry to hear uh, what, what you and your friends have been through. I mean, it's a terrible, terribly sad story, but also <laughs> typical of what is going on in the finance industry and elsewhere. Let me just fill you in a bit of information about the House of Lords. House of Lords has oral questions. So somebody asks a question, and if you are lucky, 10 other people may ask a supplementary question, okay? And supplementary means uh, you have 30 seconds to speak, okay? And the minister will take about 30 seconds. So very difficult to go into anything uh, elaborate. Then they have something called uh, uh, questions for short debates. That is, if your name comes out of the hat, and I've been putting my name in the hat every day for weeks, and it hasn't yet uh, come up. If that happens, you're lucky you might get five minutes. Uh, that, that, that is about it. The other opportunity is when bills are presented. So I was able to talk about HSBC when we had a debate on the financial services bill. Okay. Fortunately, <laughs> And uh, I think it's on October the 18th or so, we have a debate on a bill which is about compensation for London capital and finance investors. Okay, it is possible at that time I can broaden and ask about other frauds like the one you described. Why no compensation there? London capital and finance was regulated by the FCA. It failed. Uh, there was a uh, Dame Gloucester's report uh, to, to say that the FCA was ineffective. Uh, so if you send me brief details, I'll see, depending on the time available, whether I can add it to anything I have to say in the Lords about London Capital and Finance and say why no compensation for the fraud that you refer to, why no investigation? Now, of course, we can say these things, but it does not follow the minister will actually answer. They often do not answer. And what you will find is uh, uh, if they ha are having a difficult time, they will waffle on to make sure that the time for debates and questions that runs out, or often they simply just don't respond. So I shuffle the papers and say, oh, my God, I haven't been briefed on this. I better not do anything on it. So Parliament is not as good as you think it ought to be. Mm. But that is the world. And all we can do is try to uh, you know, uh, pu push to it. So, uh, so that is the kind of a parliamentary procedure. In the House of Commons, they have what is called an adjournment debate. Again, MPs put their name in a hat. If their name comes out, then they have 30 minutes to discuss just any case they want. They basically control the floor of the house to see who else can speak or not, but a minister <laughs> must come and respond. There is no hiding place for the minister. But from that, again, it does not follow that the government will deal with the problem. OK, so we have that problem all the time. So there is more opportunity if you if you want your case specifically raised, I think, in the House of Commons than in the House of Lords. But I will do my best to raise it. So the London Capital and uh, in a very glad for London Capital Finance investors to get some compensation. There are numerous problems, but there's none for your case, none for people involved in Connaught. We just heard about the fraud on Patisserie Valerie. Nothing, you know. So, so there are many, many, many things, and I'm sure Anthony would add more. So I don't want to steal his thunder uh, at the moment. But thank you for uh, 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 just letting me know your plight, and please send me some details so which I can probably refer to in two, three minutes. So roughly take about hundred words a minute, and I can speak fairly fast when I need to. So that will give you an idea. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. That, that's, that's wonderful. That's wonderfully supportive. Thank you, Prem. Thank you, Pauline. To keep us on track, we're going to get one more comment or question now. Um, we're going to go to Nigel Cairns. Nigel, can you keep it as succinct as you can, please? And then we're going to go to Prem for any final thoughts. And then we're going to go to um, Baroness Bennett of Manor Castle. Uh, Nigel Cairns, as succinctly as possible, please. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, Nigel Cairns, I've been involved in a, uh, an ongoing banking dispute for uh, the past 13 years, which was the reason for my interest to coming to TTF. Uh, my question, um, I've noticed recently in the, uh, the press that um, the Governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey, says that he, uh, he is very interested in money laundering. And he yeah. said that the reason uh, uh, he's, he's expressing his concern about it is because he thinks the introduction or the, uh, the rise of Bitcoin uh, would facilitate uh, uh, money laundering. And uh, he's very concerned about this. Uh, and I'm just wondering if he's being slightly disingenuous in uh, uh, expressing this concern. And maybe uh, there are other reasons why he doesn't like Bit Bitcoin, uh, apart from uh, his interest in uh, money laundering which doesn't seem to be, in other circumstances, very high on the agenda. That's my question. Well, money laundering predates Bitcoin, and uh, money laundering, to some extent, has always been with us. But with technology, uh, it has become so much easier and so much global. And uh, the FCA, where Andrew Bailey was, I think, failed miserably to deal with uh, banking frauds of all kinds, and uh, it continues to fail. It's interesting, China has declared all Bitcoin transactions to be illegal, but basically I think there are more, there are deeper issues. They're concerned that in China, I think the basic feeling is that only the states should be able to create money. Mm. Here, basically, it's kind of a much more laissez-faire approach, and those people who are kind of anti-state felt that others should be able to create money, and hence the birth of Bitcoin, but I think raises a lot of other issues. Uh, I don't really want to take up more time, but I think he is being disingenuous dis dis here, and I think really we need to look at the broader issues, which are basically the same for the decades, except technology has made it far easier, really. Thank you very much indeed. Another another chasm of questions could come out of that one. We haven't got time for it. This has been so, so interesting. Lord Prem Seeker, we thank you very much indeed for uh, the session you provided us with. There's decades worth of experience and insight, particularly in relation to the deficiencies in the accounting profession, the banking sector, and everything else that you are uh, sharing with us so 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 willingly. We really do show our appreciation for you doing that. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. That's been thank you, helpful. Andy, and thank you, everyone. Wonderful. We now have the pleasure of going to our second speaker, Baroness Bennett of Manor Castle. Um, TTF, as with all of the speakers we have tonight, TTF really does appreciate the opportunity to have people of this caliber come to our sessions and give up their own time to talk about issues that matter to us, but clearly also matter to them. So Natalie, if I may invite you to take the stage, so to speak, and share with us your thoughts on the topic of turning the tide on dirty money. Thank you very much indeed, thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Andy. And it's great to be following Prem again. I've been sort of having flashbacks to the financial services bill um, where he and I were very much playing tag team. And Prem, of course, he's very much the technical expert. But what I focused on and what I'll focus on tonight is the, um, the political aspects of this, which I think some of the questions have already pointed to, there's a lot of interest in. And also the real social costs of this, because sometimes people go, oh, it's a white collar crime. No one had a gun stuck in their face. No one got stabbed. It's, you know, it's, it's only a white collar crime. But I think we really do need to focus on the massive costs on our society of, uh, of corruption, and particularly in the financial sector. And I think it's interesting, we've been talking about the politics. And if you look back on those debates in Hansard from the Financial Services Bill, um, it might be more interesting reading than you might expect, but it's incredibly split the debate. Uh, and what you have is Prem and myself, and occasionally with honourable support from the Bishop of St Albans, um, who are really challenging the banking sector on corruption, who are really saying, you know, where is this money going? Why isn't this transparent? Then you have the government going, oh, no, everything's fine. It's all perfect. We have the best regulation in the world, as Prem's great line goes, best regulation for whom? And then probably the majority of speakers, both by number and by time, were actually 
people who were in one way or another could be regarded as advocates for the banking sector, people who've been in banking or accountancy um, and who come into the house and still have ties into those sectors, who were going, oh, what we want is a more competitive banking sector, by which competitive they actually meant less regulated than it is even now. And it's worth noting that um, I've been in the House of Lords about two years, Prem's been a bit over a year or so now, um, and if we weren't there, there really wouldn't have been any voices from the side of critical, challenging, asking those tough questions. There really is a huge imbalance. And I think one of the problems is, as Prem alluded to, the banking sector and the financial sector goes, oh, it's all terribly difficult and complicated. Don't worry your little heads about that. And what I really want to do is get many more members in the House of Lords, many more members of the public really engaged in these debates, because these have absolute real world consequences. And you know, one of the, um, the references that I made in those debates was to something that's a total mouthful. It's called the UN High Level Panel on International Financial Accountability, Transparency and Integrity for Achieving the 2030 Agenda. Luckily, it's known as FACTI, F-A-C-T-I for short. And that 2030 Agenda is, of course, the Sustainable Development Goals that the world is signed up to things like ending hunger, um, ensuring children get education. And this report from people who were former bank governors, people who are very former, former really senior um, political leaders around the world, points out that 2.7% of global GDP is laundered. That's a massive sum of money that's not available to be spent potentially on constructive purposes, because of course, what's happening to most of this money is it's being pumped off into tax havens, pumped off through secret accounts, and very often it's just sitting there. Um, this is money that's not going around in the economy, not available. And of course, the uh, that factory panel said that jurisdiction shopping, essentially tax dodging mostly, um, is costing 600 billion US dollars a year. So what you've got is that's money that's not going into aid, not going into food, not going into education, not going into hospitals. And of course, a lot of that, that money is stolen from the global south, what used to be known as the developing countries. And one of the things that I think I often use social media to talk about this and try and highlight cases whenever they arise is there's often this feeling that corruption is something that happens in the global south, you know, that terrible corrupt oil minister or, you know, that, that terrible corrupt dictator that took a heap of money from, from a mining company. But let's ask the question of who paid that money. Invariably, that money comes from the global north. It comes from uh, resource companies, oil and gas companies, mining companies in the global north. Um, it comes from arms companies, manufacturing companies very often. It goes through banks and the financial sector. And then indeed, of course, it very often comes straight back into London, um, which is the dirty money capital as has been said before. Um, and that money is sitting in you know, very expensive real estate property um, that's very often sitting there empty. Um, there are streets in, um, in the center of London apparently residential streets that you can walk down um, in the evening and there's, there's no lights on because what they are are not homes, those what you think of as houses, they're not homes, they're places where people store cash um, and no one's actually there. And if we think about the actual costs of this, that also, you know, of course we have a huge homelessness, a huge housing problem in London, that's another cost that we're putting on. So if we look at the, the real politics of the background of this, and a lot of this goes back to a brilliant book, book I read um, many years ago um, called Treasure Islands by Nicholas Shackson. Um, and that talks about the role of the city of London. And having read that, I really looked quite deeply into the history of the city of London. And many people don't realize that the city is like this tiny black hole, this black hole around it, you have a reasonable level of democracy. You know, we have a mayor and elected assembly for the rest of London, uh, but the mayor, Sajid Javid has no say at all in that square mile in the city of London. That's controlled by the corporation. Um, and corporation is the last rotten borough. Uh, the financial com companies, mostly, the companies that run do business in the city have more votes than the residents of the city. And the city on its own website says it exists to support the financial sector and deregulation. 
And one of the other things that uh, many people don't know about is there's a, uh, a character called the Remembrancer, and he, and it has always been a he, um, has special rights within the Houses of Parliament, particularly within the Commons, and can see and comment on all legislation before it goes to MPs. And this is you, a historical accident that comes from the fact that um, uh, somewhere back in the mists of time, the, um, the City of London helped save Parliament from the King, and so Parliament granted City this special right. There's also something called the City Cash, which has an income of at least 100 million pounds a year. And some of that money, the City likes to highlight this, goes to things like upkeep of Hampstead Heath, a few nice high profile charities. But a lot of that money is actually money that can be used to promote the financial sector. So you've got this at the heart of London, at the heart of Britain, right down the road from Westminster, this great black hole. Now, what you've also got is, of course, the fact that we don't have any state funding of political parties or politics in the UK. Um, there's been a lot of focus recently, particularly in the context of, of planning regulations and particular planning events. Uh, Robert uh, Jenrick and, uh, and uh, Robert Desmond uh, come to mind here um, in terms of planning. But a lot of the money that goes into both political parties, uh, but obviously particularly the Tories, uh, comes from the financial sector. Uh, and um, Prem was talking about you know, where policy advice in, it comes from in, the, in financial regulation. Well, one of the things you'll find is if you go back through the records, companies like PricewaterhouseCoopers and other similar firms actually donate large amounts of staff time to both of the largest political parties to draw up their policies. Um, interesting that, isn't it? That's where it comes from. And if you look at... Um, something Caroline Lucas, the Green MP, has done a great deal of work on. It's not just restricted to the financial sector. If you also find there's a revolving door between the gas industry, particularly, um, and uh, Bayes, uh, the Department of Energy, various other names it's had. And so you have someone seconded from the gas industry making energy policy. So what we've got is a problem where I've got a phrase that sort of sums this up. We get the politics that they pay for they being the people who fund political parties and provide them with resources. Um, and that means very often the financial sector. Um, and, you know, even if the people involved individually have the best will in the world, they've come from that culture, their thoughts of all, thinking has all been formed by that culture. And that's the way things are. And I think it's interesting, um, Prem mentioned HSBC. Uh, and the sheer amor amorality of these, um, uh, these structures, these bodies, these institutions. Um, I'm also co-chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Hong Kong, and we've actually just announced and we've started an inquiry into the behaviour of the financial sector in Hong Kong, because what we've seen, of course, is um, several very prominent financial institutions have very clearly aligned themselves with the Chinese government with the destruction of the rule of law, with the repressive national security law. Um, and they've actually frozen the accounts of uh, people who've been democratic activists. Um, they can't get money that is clearly their own money out. Um, and people's pensions even have been frozen. Um, and we're having an inquiry. We're gonna really document what's happening here. Something we did previously with the mistreatment of first aiders and doctors in Hong Kong because these things need to be documented and written down and recorded. Um, but, you know, this is a case where you might think that, um, you know, a repressive regime that banks, financial institutions wouldn't side with them, but they very much are. And the point, of course, I would make to them is that if you destroy the rule of law, if you have a situation where the government is in no way under any kind of control of the rule of law, then actually you're creating a very dangerous business environment. But I think finally, um, I'm always believe that dialogue is better than monologue. So I want to allow plenty of time for questions. But I do just really want to sort of circle back to thinking about what this means for actually for our politics. And here I'm going to go to an organization called the Center for American Progress, which isn't necessarily representative of what you broadly describe as my side of politics. But they put out a report called Turning the Tide on Dirty Money. And the forward to that was signed by the chairman of the US uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, by Tom Tugendhat, the chair of the UK Foreign Affairs Committee, 
and David McAllister, the chair of the EU Parliamentary Committee on, Women, on Foreign Affairs. Now, the authors in that say that corruption, quote, threatens the resilience and cohesion of democratic governments around the globe and undermines the relationship between the state and its citizens. And I think it's worth thinking back to the uh, Brexit referendum without opening any particular debates on that area, but thinking back to the slogan that won the Brexit referendum, which was take back control. And I would say that the people who felt like they weren't in control of their own lives, they weren't in control of their own country were right. But the problem wasn't the financial, wasn't the Brussels. The problem lay with a financial sector, a business sector that has control of our politics, big multinational companies, financial sector and others um, wow. who in an utterly unlevel playing field. And you know, the reason why we have a handful of large supermarkets dominating our our food supplies, our supplies of many things, why we have, um, if you come to agri-foods, chemical companies, in all of these things, there's a handful, of small com a handful of companies, a small selection who dominate everything. You know, what the Americans call trust, what we call competitiveness is a real problem. And lots of those are actually owned by the same half dozen hedge funds. Um, I, you know, the financial sector, owns 10% owns 10 of half a dozen companies that dominate the whole sector. And it's actually the same financial companies that, that own those. And of course, it's not just the obvious sort of competitive uh, capitalism things they own. We've also got hedge funds owning our, um, our care homes. Uh, and hedge funds own our care homes and take out, um, there's some really good work on this. The FT actually has been, the Financial Times has been quite big on this they take out 12% return, 12% or higher return out of caring for our most vulnerable citizens. Um, and that gives them a lot of money sloshing around to put wow. in politics. Wow. And that, you know, coming back to, to, to the point about, you know, a real problem of democratic legitimacy, cohesion of democratic governments, you might be thinking about that in other places, but it applies in the UK, it applies in the US, it applies to all of us. And what do we do? Well, I think I, I always like to finish on a positive note. So I'm gonna finish on a positive note, which is I referred to the fact that the FT you know, has done quite a bit of work on the way um, care homes are being turned into cash cows for hedge funds. Uh, the FT also has done quite a bit of work on um, the um, uh, water companies and how they've been utterly loaded with debt and massive dividends have been taken out of them at the same time and money hasn't been invested and our pipes all leak and sewerage is, I mean, I'm going to Whitstable next week, talk about how sewerage is spilling into the ocean on a totally regular daily basis. All of these things, what I would call the intelligent end of, the, of our current political system is going, we really can't let this keep running anymore. Mm. So there is starting to be increasing awareness, increasing highlighting of this, and increasing recognition that this can't continue. And, you know, more power to Transparency Task Force, everyone on this call, everyone who's working on, on this. And I really look forward to questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you so, so much. It sounds to me like the political system needs overhauling. It really, it really, really does. The closer you look, the less democracy you see. That's how it seems to me. Thank you, Natalie. That was wonderful. Uh, please, uh, please raise your hand if you'd like to make a point to Natalie or ask a question. Uh, wave away if you'd like to do that. If you can't think of one, I've got a question I'd like to say. So, Natalie, hypothetically, you're now in charge of the government. Yeah, um, you've got a magic wand. You could achieve any change you wanted. C could you talk about maybe one or two practical things? within our democratic system that could actually make a real difference in driving out the kind of reform and progressive thinking that is needed? What would you ideally like to see happen? Well, one of the first things I'd like to see is, and this might look a long way from financial regulation, but as you alluded to, you, our system now utterly is not working and it's not democratic. The um, Boris Johnson got 100% of the power with, by winning 44% of the votes um, in 2019. So you know, I would like to make 
um, our system genuinely a democracy that means a proportional elected system. Yeah. I'd like to abolish my own job and elect the House of Lords as well. Um, you know, so actually give people control um, and combine with that, um, basically ban big money from politics. Um, and so you know, say that you you maybe you can crowdfund and people can give their 10 quid or whatever, but basically, you know, and this is politically quite a difficult thing to say because people go, oh, um, you know, giving money to politicians, why are we doing that? But that means if the whole country, the society, people pay for politics, you get politics that belongs to you, yes. not politics that belongs to the financial sector. And, you know, this is not sort of wild or exotic. I mean, I'm actually speaking to you from Brussels because I'm here for a meeting of the um, Green European Journal, which is below, which is um, the organ of the Green European Foundation. And that's funded by, um, that's part of an umbrella of all green think, think tanks across Europe. And many of those, the Germans, the French, many of the others, each significant political force in the country gets some money for policy development from the government. And that's proportional to the number of votes they've got in the last election, because there's an acknowledgement that for political parties to function, you know, they need expert advice, they need to be able to employ researchers to, to develop ideas, to put out reports, to hold seminars. And that's state funded, because that's regarded as part of the political process that everyone should have the money coming in from. So, you know, the Heinrich Boll Foundation is a name that many people might recognise. And, you know, in the UK, we've got a couple of very small, very, very, very lightly funded green think tanks. And the Heinrich Boll is just on an entirely different level altogether because they've got a whole lot of government funding that comes both from the um, federal level and also the state level. So, you know, if we actually saw our politics belonging to people, uh, and that means parliament reflecting the views of the people, Parliament, you know, no safe seats so people can be held to account, then, you know, we'd be starting to get to a very different place. Wonderful. What a great answer. I absolutely, I absolutely agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. I'd go as far as to say that until we have democracy representing the interests of the people, we'll have all kinds of deep rooted societal problems that will manifest in many, many ways. Tonight, we happen to be talking about turning the tide on dirty money, but we could be talking about exploitation through the through the food system, through pharmaceuticals, through the environmental issues and everything else, it all, to my mind, anchors back to exactly the point you've just made so powerfully, Natalie. Thank you so much. We're going to be moving on. Can we please uh, show our appreciation to Natalie? There is going to be a Q&A session a little, little bit later on, but to keep things moving, we've got to go further ahead. Natalie, that was superb, and thank you very much indeed for being with us tonight. And we'll obviously be inviting you back again as soon as we can. We're going to go straight to Shay now. We're going to go Shay, straight to Shay. So Shay, not everybody will know about your organisation, so if you don't mind, Please tell everybody a bit about yourself, a bit about your organisation, and then launch into what you'd like to say, sir, about turning the tide on dirty money. Thank you very much indeed, Shay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. And, and thank you, uh, Prem and, and uh, uh, Baroness Bennett, uh, for an incredible, incredible opening to, to this important de debate. Uh, so very quickly, I'll try to introduce myself and really get into the heart of the matter. Uh, so I'm a global head of financial crime at a, a company called Refinitiv. Uh, we used to be part of Thomson Reuters. Uh, in effect, we are a, a data service provider to banks, uh, corporates, law enforcement, government, uh, in order for them to fight financial crime in their various ma manifestations. And so, so we have uh, we, we cover 190 countries, 65 languages. Um, we have a, a multitude, thousands of people who are working on this day to day in order to empower organizations to, to do the best they can to, uh, to, to address their issue as far as how that impacts their, their business and, and making sure that they meet the regulatory requirements. But beyond that, beyond that, that's, that's, the, uh, you know, that's the ticker in terms of what we do. We're also firm believers that we need to do more. We need to do more because we actually see um, what some of the financial crime trends are. We're a global company. We're based in, the, in London. We're based in the UK, but we're, we operate globally. And this is by inherent a global issue. Uh, so while we recognize that there are you know, difficulties in, in the UK system and regulatory system, London is one of the financial centers, along with uh, New York, Singapore, Hong Kong, and many other countries. This is not a London problem. 
it's not a UK problem, it's a global problem. And so how do we, you know, th that's kind of our perspective. How do we kind of, uh, you know, join the dots in terms of what we can do? I'm not going to go through the problem statement. Uh, Prem has done a phenomenal job, and it's not isolated to London or the UK. It's the same issue that we hear all, all across the world. Uh, and of course, this has implications, uh, per, per uh, Baroness Bennett's point about this is not just a financial crime, money laundering problem, but it, this cuts the heart of, of impacting people, society, human trafficking. There's more human trafficking now than it was when, when modern day slavery um, or slavery was legal. Uh, it has an impact on all kinds of permutations. So I guess I like to focus my points on three issues from an industry perspective. Uh, and then I'd, I'd like to open up the, the Q&A. Uh, the first is incentives. What incentives are there really for uh, politicians, policymakers, and particularly the industry to change their behavior? Uh, and and this, this for me is a, is, a, is, a, is a key point for me because I, I rely on my previous experience at the New York Fed during the financial crisis uh, and, and other experiences where behavior really doesn't change unless the incentives are there to calibrate that. Meaning what? For banks, they need to be punished, but also uh, given latitude if they're doing the right thing and, and really trying to address issues around money laundering and, and modern day slavery. So reduce their capital. Uh, same thing for credit rating agencies that have a role to play in terms of how they rate securities, how they rate companies, and financial crime uh, needs to be part of that equation. Uh, so that, that's, that's kind of one piece in terms of the incentives, and I'd you know, love to hear what other people think about that particular point. The, sec the second is in the narrative needs to change, and, and we've alluded to that a little bit. We've alluded to, to lack of taxes, we've alluded to uh, you know, some other issues, but actually, and I reflect now as a company because we've done some research on this issue, financial crime actually cuts to the heart of sustainability. When you actually look at uh, illegal logging, illegal fishing, uh, human trafficking, a lot of the aspects that we're now dealing with in terms of the sustainability agenda, it turns out, according to our research, that environmental crime or green crime is the way we call it, is the biggest uh, biggest issue of all in terms of organized crime, uh, getting illicit proceeds from these and the devastation that it's causing uh, to, our, to our planet. And of course, a tight to corruption as well, because none of these things could be done without customs officials, law enforcement officials and senior politicians being part, uh, a part of that game. So that's the other piece. Uh, we need to change the dynamics and the narrative around this because AML, KYC, EDD, they are lifeless terms that don't mean much. And most people don't actually recognize what that means. It's some technical term has to do with compliance and God forbid you mentioned compliance, but actually no, it has to do with all these, all these all the issues that, that are pertinent uh, uh, today. And, and by the way, this is not me speaking, this is the Europol speaking, Interpol is the biggest um, risk that they are focusing on as we currently speak. You know, I just spoke with them two days ago. They have, most of the resources are, are geared towards cyber crime, uh, COVID related fraud and environmental crime. The third, the third is engagement. How do we engage in a different way? And I say we collectively, policymakers, industry, you know, all, all of us who are on this call in a way that we know what the problem is, but how do we find a solution? How do we move beyond uh, kind of thinking that, you know, we can't do anything, you know, and, and there's, there, there's much for us to do. So I guess that's, from my perspective, uh, the call to action. Uh, and, and our call to action, certainly my call to action, has been to form the Global Coalition to Fight Financial Crime, uh, together with the World Economic Forum, Europol, Interpol, uh, European Banking Federation, uh, alongside many NGOs, by the way, and civil society, an incredible part of this puzzle, uh, because NGOs work in parts of the world that are very difficult uh, to, to get in, in information. We've heard about the Panama Papers, all the rest of it. 
There are NGOs out there who day by day risk their life and their limb uh, to, to report, uh, you know, corruption and all the rest of it. So how do we bring them into this in order to inform policymakers in a more effective way to institute legislation that actually increases effectiveness into the system? And part of it has to do with public registries. Part of it has to do with information sharing capacities. Part of it has to do with whistleblowing uh, legislation, and we can go on and on. But but I think the point is, is that how do we kind of collectively be as sophisticated and networks as the criminals are networked? Because the only way to fight the network is becoming a network yourself. And I guess that would be certainly from my perspective. And, and while we are a data company supplying data for, for all these pieces, you know, we, we are dedicated uh, to kind of you know build bridges and, and kind of drive drive that agenda in a way where we can all kind of bring our expertise. So we're much you know results oriented. You know, let's make sure that we move away from that one percent figure that the UNDP issued a few years ago in terms of amount of money laundering. It's actually caught in the system uh, to 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 a much more effective uh, way. So I'll end it there, Andy. You know, I can't thank you enough for the invitation. Happy to take questions, but uh, you know I, I'm curious that there's there's many people here with incredible expertise. So I prefer to have the to have the discussion as a Q and A. Wonderful show, really, really insightful. I have to ask you, please, 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 tell us a bit more about the Global Coalition to Fight Financial Crime. Uh, what's its objective? Who's involved? What? Uh, how is it operating? How can we support it, Shay? And then we'll go to Mr. Anthony Stansfield. Yeah, no, happy to, to, to answer that. So um, ironically, well, not ironically, um, in a meeting that I had well, pre-COVID, I had with uh, Mr. Uh, Sir Rob Wainwright, who was the executive director of Europol at that time. And in a meeting, we kind of talked about, and he was outgoing, and, and he's kind of had enough, like, okay, we, we in, we're in the same discussions, the same issues. And I said, well, why don't we do something different? Why don't we kind of form a, a group of, of, of like-minded organizations who are really willing to, to share, you know, how we promote this issue and engage with policymakers. So you don't have to engage as law enforcement or banks or data, you know, how it can kind of garner. And so that was the initial kernel of that idea. And then, in it, and then we very quickly engaged with the World Economic Forum, Interpol, Royal United Service Institute, European Banking Federation, the Century started by George Clooney, I mean, on and on and on. And it's kind of just gained, gained momentum since then. And, and so that was the initial impetus. So what's our, what are our objectives? The objectives are three. The first is to inform policymakers that the, the current regime that we're working under is completely ineffective. Now, that may sound like the most obvious thing to us, but for civil society and the policymakers, this is a revelation. And, and we mean by ineffective that if you look at financial, the Financial Action Task Force as the inception of the fight against financial crime, it's been working for 30 years. And yet we're, we're achieving a, a less than 1%, in fact, 0.2% effectiveness rate in terms of the amount of proceeds that are caught in law enforcement. Now, I don't know about you, I'm no business person, but if you had, if someone gave you some money and said there's a you know, 98% chance that you're going to make money, that's a pretty good deal. And, and that's just not good enough. Yeah. Second is we need to promote more information sharing and partnership amongst the public and the private sector. And then third, of course, is to, is to identify areas where there are competing regulatory regimes that don't really they're not you know, cohesive in terms of us enable, enabling us to do that, you know, including a lot, of, a lot of global regimes. So that was the that was initial intent and, and uh, certainly we've grown quite a bit. And there's a lot for us to do. We focus a lot on Europe. We can talk about our, our activities there. The AML Action Plan is, part, is very much a function of our, our engagement there. The UK will be very much engaged there. The US as well. We're about to shift our attention on, on in Asia in the next year or so to, to look at trade trade based money laundering and, and, and other issues. But but that was the intent and, and kind of how it all got started. 
Oh, that sounds like a wonderful, wonderful initiative. What a great idea. Let's all please explore that. I put the link to the website of the Global Coalition to Fight Financial Crime into the chat. Let's let's look into it. Let's support it. Thank you, Shay. That's great to know about. We've got time for one person to speak next before we go to our next speaker, Duncan. Uh, Anthony Stanspell, can you please uh, share your point, please? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, Shay, it's really a question. You started right off by saying, what incentive is there to sort this out? <clears throat> well, I believe the only incentive is a criminal prosecutions. At the moment, all these cases end up in civil courts where absolutely nothing is done. And they are serious enough and the sums of money are so vast that I think prison sentences should uh, be imposed. Fining banks is totally irrelevant. The only people who are fined are the shareholders. When HBOS was fined 65 million, reduced to 45 million by the Financial Conduct Authority for their cooperation, which I have to say was non existent, <laughs> who suffered? Not one single director suffered. So, what other than criminal prosecution incentive is there? That is a fantastic question. And that cuts to the heart of many things that were said by Prem and, and, uh, and others as well. You know, uh, so. Enforcement is an issue. Let's forget, let's put, let's part the criminal prosecution at a side because not even enforcement uh, is, is effective. Um, and, and yeah, you know, the US ends up being uh, the global enforcer of money laundering in a way, uh, but that's not good enough either. And so, so for me, that's, that's the biggest, we need to raise the cost of capital in a way to, to make sure that uh, organizations are incentivized to do the right thing and doing the right thing doesn't mean that, you know, it's just a cost, it's an expense here, but it's actually part of their ethos as a company. And I, and I tend to believe, and maybe I'm naive this way, but there is, there is something to be said about, you know, the next generation, there's a biggest transfer of wealth about, about, to, about to happen between one generation to another, $30 trillion is estimated. And the next generation, they do care about these issues. They do care about sustainability. They do care about the workers' rights and all the rest of it. And so my, my point, and I have these conversations with, with the industry, either you, know, either you lead, you follow, or you get out of the way. But at some point, uh, you're going to need to make a decision. So, so I guess that's my first point. On the second piece, I agree. There's no criminal prosecution. But from my perspective... Uh, being being a book a bit more um, you know critical on, on this issue, companies will just say you know okay this individual got it, in fact it would be easier for organizations to say you know what all this issue was related to Che okay I, I wasn't part of any of this but let's say Che is the one so we're going to get rid of him and 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 uh, in a way it goes when actually the behavior of the company so code of conduct and and all the rest of these issues that have been uh, pointed out in, in sort of the regulatory regime after uh, the, the financial crisis uh, code of conduct, uh, it needs to be part of it. So, but the bottom line to your point is the enforcement mechanism needs to be there. The incentive me uh, mechanism needs to be there. And, and we all have a part to play in terms of what that means. I've pointed to regulators, cap, you know, supervisors, credit rating agencies, and all the rest of it. But I'm sure there's 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 more to include there. That's, that's such, such a rich exchange. Thank you, Anthony, for your point and that response. But the problem is, Shay, I guess, is that if we strip away the morality of all this, if we get take out the right and wrong bit completely for the moment, it is currently entirely rational for people to become crooks and fraudsters and money launderers because they're going to get a 98% chance of getting away with it. It would be the most rational thing going. That's the problem. You're absolutely right, sir. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, could I invite you please to do two things concurrently? One is to applaud to show our appreciation to Shay whilst also simultaneously welcoming our next speaker, Duncan. Thank you very much, Shay. That was perfect. Really great. Really, really great indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, Duncan from Transparency International. Um, over to you, sir. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks very much, Duncan. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. And it's an absolute pleasure for me to uh, act as respondent to your, your three earlier speakers uh, this evening. Uh, I, I've been following uh, Prem's work on uh, the analysing the, the faults of what is supposed to be anti-money laundering 
supervision since long before he arrived in the House of Lords. And uh, Natalie's analysis of how this um, dirty money problem is actually connected to much more fundamental governance problems in the way our democracy works or doesn't work it is, it is really astute and, and a very valuable contribution that is rarely made in this debate. And, and I'm really glad to hear about the work that Shay is doing. And um, I hope that after tonight's event, I'll have an opportunity to follow up with each of your, your speakers and work out how we can collaborate uh, in the future. Transparency International is an anti-corruption campaign and um, founded in 1994 and, and didn't start off as uh, an exercise in dealing with dirty money. We got stuck into dirty money because, uh, as was alluded to earlier, it's, it's absolutely not true to think of white collar crime as being a victimless crime. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, money laundering is, as, as I put it, the getaway car for any number of yeah, heinous crimes from uh, your traditional bank robbery, the Great Moldovan bank robbery, uh, stole a, a sum equivalent to a quarter of that country's GDP, um, to um, other matters such as uh, counter-terrorism, terrorism financing, uh, nuclear proliferation, uh, all sorts of activities that we don't want to happen uh, need to be financed. And, th and the way that they're financed needs to be out with uh, legal means of moving money around. Uh, in fact, if, if we are to have any chance at all, and I, you know, I'm, I'm not saying it's likely, but if we are to have any chance at all of, of getting the current uh, government or the chancellor uh, interested in tackling this issue. It's it's out of uh, Rishi Sunak's concern about wild elephants because the illicit wildlife trade it itself um, produces dirty money. And, uh, and so the reason we as people who were concerned about corruption got interested in dirty money was because it was the means of enabling people involved in that predicate events, just as much as all of the others that I've mentioned, of getting away with their wrongdoing. Uh, and um, we have concluded that there are three things we need to do uh, about, uh, about this. And whether you're concerned about tax evasion or illicit wildlife trade or terrorism financing, uh, you, need, you need to deal with uh, the, the way all of that uh, is able to uh, reward those criminals. Uh, and so three things to do. One is to ensure that these uh, original offenders have nowhere to hide and nowhere to hide uh, the proceeds of their crime. Second is to ensure that there is no one to help them do it. Uh, and that's where we really have to turn and look at the responsibilities of people here in our own society and uh, in the city that we've heard about. And thirdly, we need to make sure that there is what we call no impunity, put simply no getting away with it. And it's only by attacking all three of these parts of how this crime takes place that, that we can really shift the incentives, uh, as Shay put it, uh, really make it so hard that we are able to, as you challenged us in the title of this talk tonight, turn the tide. So I can't take you through all of that in much detail in the time we have available tonight, but firstly, nowhere to hide. You know, offshore offers anonymity and secrecy behind the ownership of assets. So if you have proceeds of your crime, being able to hold those proceeds through the assets of companies in networks of companies that break the trail between you and the asset. That's how, that's how you get away with this, rather than holding the proceeds of your crime where everyone can see them right in front of them. So it's that kind of distancing, layering is, is the essential element of effective money laundering. Uh, so we've been campaigning for the public registries that Shay mentioned. 
uh, and we're slowly making progress. Um, Natalie will know from her colleagues in the European Union that the fifth anti-money laundering directive has been a, a really uh, influential move to uh, expand the reach of uh, public registries. I was going to say like the one we have in the UK, but you've already heard of its limitations in terms of trust, in terms of limited liability partnership, and frankly also in terms of the accuracy of the data that's on it. All of these things need to be addressed. Um, uh, and these are challenges that other countries moving to public registers will have to follow too. Interestingly, it's the need to have alignment with the expectations uh, inside the European Union that drove the Crown dependencies to voluntarily announce their intention to move towards this standard as well. Uh, and, um, and that's something that we also need to see in Britain's uh, overseas uh, territories. Uh, which uh, the Parliament, uh, the UK Parliament, managed to force the government's hand in the passing of the Sanctions and Money Laundering Act to uh, set a, a deadline to to require that public registers should be introduced in these territories. They haven't yet, I might add, uh, but um, that there is a means by which uh, we we can force force the issue of if, if that as I suspect it will be, is, is necessary. So um, let's, not, let's not, however, absolve ourselves of doing more about this here in the UK. So rather than waiting for the British Virgin Islands to unveil who owns its companies, who's behind its companies, and therefore owns the assets those companies have, we should cotton on to something that we've learned from the Panama Papers and all of the other leaks that Prem mentioned earlier which is that this money isn't actually in the British Virgin Islands. The, the, the assets aren't actually in the British Virgin Islands. This is all just um, uh, uh, one of those institutional imaginations which are uh, you know, part of how our financial system works. Um, what we find is that those houses that Natalie mentioned in Knightsbridge in Eaton Square are owned by companies registered in the British Virgin Islands. And so the safety deposit boxes in our issue of kleptocrats, of corrupt politicians, are here in London. And even if we don't get public registries in the British Virgin Islands, we could have a requirement that for a foreign company, foreign registered company to own real estate in the United Kingdom, it has to declare its beneficial owner in the same way that UK registered limited companies have to declare their beneficial owner in the same way that if you or I personally own a, a property or the freehold on a property, our ownership of that is already declared uh, on the land registry. Now that isn't the case yet, um, but uh, there is legislation which has been drafted by uh, officials uh, in the government uh, and which was subjected to pre-legislative scrutiny of both houses of parliament and had the support, cross-party support I should add, um, of both houses of parliament is ready um, and, and there's, no, there's no point in waiting any longer. In fact, the, the real question is, given the result of that pre-legislative scrutiny, why wasn't that legislation introduced in the last Queen's speech? Why wasn't it introduced in the Queen's speech beforehand? And if whenever the next um, one of these scandals emerges, people despair as to why, why, ha why haven't we done anything about it? We've got some legislation ready to go. It could be put in front of MPs before Christmas. Um, so we need, we need to make sure there's nowhere to hide, but we also need to make sure that we crack this supervision problem. Uh, and there are too many conflicts of interest as, as Otbass has reported and as Prem described earlier in our anti-money laundering um, supervision system. We need to consolidate that with a, with a regulator, supervisor uh, that can focus on this job, not one that's preoccupied with other, other tasks like commercial revenue and customs is, uh, and can do a job without worrying about its members walking away if it starts to take enforcement seriously, as, as we heard before. Yeah. Now, yeah. just finally on enforcement, we know that for all the thousands of SARS that are suspicious activity reports that are filed, um, there is totally insufficient capacity inside law enforcement to act on them. And, um, and, and I, you know, I have sympathy for Shay's concerns that frankly, all of the money that's being spent by the 
companies, often banks that are producing these suspicious reports and doing this transaction monitoring, is wasted if law enforcement is no in no position to act. Now, you know, government is always concerned, well, you, know, you spend money on this and you haven't got money to spend on the other, and there are lots of other things that people care about. But you know what? Tackling economic crime raises revenue in the States, right? It, it's self-funding. And it's beginning to be in the United Kingdom as well. The Serious Fraud Office over the last five years has generated 1.5 billion pounds worth of financial penalties, which have gone straight into the exchequer. That's not compensation, that's not gone to victim, it's gone straight into the national coffers. But there's no relationship between that income and the funding of our law enforcement. So I will put it to you, given everything you've just showed us on the violations tracker, Andy, mm -hmm. that if government properly funded economic crime law enforcement, whether that's in the serious fraud office or in the National Crime Agency or proper supervision uh, or investment in IT to actually make decent use of all of these suspicious activity reports, it would end up funding itself in the ability to bring in more penalties. So we don't have to make hard choices between the fight against financial crime uh, and, you know, decent pay for our nurses or any of the other things we need to spend money on. Uh, they learned that in the DOJ. It's one of the reasons why um, uh, crime, uh, financial crime and corruption investigations continued even under Trump uh, in the United States, because, mm -hmm. you know, without mm -hmm. his interference, you know, they, they were able to finance all of this work um, through their penalties. And we need that kind of independence uh, in our own law enforcement, instead of the serious fraud office having to take the begging bowl to ask for special dispensation to fund an inve complex investigation every time it, it, it's got a, a really complicated case to work on. So I will have to stop so that you can move to questions to your team. But, but there, are, there are, just a reminder, those are our three prongs. Nowhere to hide, no one to help, and no getting away with it. And if we attack each of those, I think we can fundamentally shift the calculus of, of money laundering in, in our economy at least, uh, and meet your challenge of turning the tide in 35. That was really was wonderful. Um, we are, we've got such a masterclass tonight. That was fantastic. That really was. I have to say, Duncan, your line, I think I wrote it down, um, your line about, um, um, about um, money laundering is, is a, the getaway car to all kinds of heinous crimes. That's absolutely brilliant. It is absolutely brilliant. I love that. Um, love that. Absolutely did love that. Shay, you put your hand up, sir. Over to you, and then we'll go to one or two others, and then we'll move on to our final speaker, Mr. Anthony Stansfield. Shay, back to you, sir. Yeah, no, no I'll try to be very, very quick here, but uh, Duncan, we need to have a conversation because there is, um, in terms of public registries, there is a, a focus on that in the EU, you focus on the EU uh, and other parts of the world, but uh, you are right. There are other forces at work to try to limit uh, or try to um, bring down the transparency rather than raise the, raise the transparency. And we're currently, as I speak, today, yesterday and next week on, on conversations with senior policymakers who, who drive the legislation on these issues. So that, that's my only point. There was a shout out Let's connect, let's talk, and, and let's bring it forward. That sounds like a great idea. I, I get more satisfaction from the simple, pleasant reality that TTF sometimes connects people that go on to do good things together. That, that for me, is a really rewarding thing. So if, as a consequence of tonight's conversation, we end up with Duncan and Shay and others having good conversations, and that's really really worthwhile these are not sterile events that don't produce outcomes they really really do so that's great to hear that interest in each other thank you so much mr nigel cairns you're next sir thank you uh thank you question for or a point to, to duncan i think i read in the um the press in the fast past few days that uh, morrison's supermarket uh are planning to register in the cayman islands um one wonders you know if a company like uh, Morrison's uh, supermarket thinks that there's a, a financial benefit to be had. Surely all companies shortly are going to be um, registering offshore. It, it seems to be a bit of a tsunami. Um, well, um, it's news to me, but you're right. I mean, there are any number of companies that are registered offshore. Uh, and um, 
and many of them will do it because it, it's a way to, to pay less tax. Um, and you know, I don't for a moment suggest that Morrison's is going to get into the money laundering business. I, I know there's a there's at least one person in this audience who knows an awful lot more about what goes on in the Cayman Islands than I do, and I, I wonder whether you'd be better off uh, with Andy getting him him to comment. But but all I would say is that what we see time and time again is that if you have enough money in today's world you can choose what rules you are governed by. And there is no justice in that. You know, there's one rule for us, and for them, they can choose what set of rules they want, whether it's golden visas, passports for sale in Cyprus or uh, the Caribbean, or, um, or, or, or frankly, some of the things that were described by your earlier speakers in terms of how certain organizations are able to influence policy to their own ends. Uh, and um, that, that's why we are campaigning. I mean, TI is global. Um, ours is a small team in London, but we are part of a group of many other teams in over 100 countries. We, we are trying to drive these changes as global standards. And my, my colleagues in, in Berlin have been doing a lot of work on what's called um, Recommendation 24 by the Financial mm -hmm. Action Task Force to try and move forward on these public registries such that they become something which is expected um, to be the case wherever companies are registered in the world. Um, we, we're a long way from it yet, but, but we've certainly got our sights on this, not just in the UK, not even just in Britain's overseas territories, but because otherwise, you know, if all you achieve is displacement, you haven't actually solved the problem. Thank you so much, Nigel, and for your response as well, Duncan. If only we had time to spare, but we don't. So we're going to have to quickly, quickly move on. Duncan, that was really, really very, very interesting indeed. Such good ideas. Okay. Such good ideas. Thank you very much indeed. We'd love to have you back as well. Thank you so much. We're now going to go to Anthony Stansfeld, who has spoken on many occasions for the Transparency Task Force. Anthony is a man that we hold in very, very high regard. Take a look at Anthony's profile and background. I, I put a, a Wikipedia page into the chat. You know, if anybody can help clear up corruption in the Hong Kong police, then it just goes to show the kind of integrity and resourcefulness and resilience and tenacity this gentleman has. Uh, Anthony, once again, we are very grateful to you for spending time with us. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Andy, thank you very much. You gave me, I think you gave me five minutes. I'm going to have to be very brief indeed. Um, but Prem, Natalie, Che and Duncan, I mean, I agree with everything you've said. And Duncan, one thing you said right at the end, that the fines that have gone on, have all, the over a billion pounds, has all gone straight back to the Exchequer. This rang home with me. It cost Thames Valley £7 million to take on the HBOS case in Reading, a major banking fraud. Uh, they were eventually fined 45 million. Not one penny came back for Thames Valley Police. The whole lot was taken by the Treasury. And so the incentive for police forces, and Thames Valley was a big police force, the incentive for smaller police forces to take on a fraud, it, it, there isn't one. There is every indication they shouldn't take on a major fraud. But there has been a total failure by the police, most police forces, by the regulatory authorities, by the courts or the banks themselves to actually investigate major fraud. After the HBOS case in Reading, after the convictions, I went to see Andrew Bailey and had quite a long meeting with him in the city of London and laid out in some detail that it was going on, what was going on in HBOS was going on in other major clearing banks as well. He did absolutely precisely nothing about it. He is now governor of the Bank of England and I find that extraordinary, I have to say. The National Crime Agency uh, was given two years ago a number of files. There are now 27 files, detailed files of forged bank documents that have been used in courts to bankrupt companies and individuals. They've had this for two years and they are still assessing it. Not a single victim has actually been interviewed by them. So absolutely precisely nothing is done about it. In these cases, these are not small cases. The total sums of money involved, over 700 of them, run into many, many billions, far bigger than the drugs trade. And not one single one has been investigated. Within those files, there is clear evidence 
a forged personal guarantees, a forged contracts with banks, a forged bank accounts that people were not aware of, setting up bank accounts in people's names that they know nothing about, and forged bank statements. I saw a lo one lovely one, two statements from one bank, it was Lloyd's, same sort code number, same bank account numbers, same dates, totally different figures in the two that were being run in parallel. One was shown to the courts and one was being shown to the victim. And there was a divergence of over 400,000 pounds between those bank accounts. And that has gone on on an industrial scale. We had action fraud. It was the only thing. If a fraud was reported, a police force would pop, send, say, send it to action fraud. Well, action fraud was a complete joke. And I think the Times newspaper carried two pages on it, laying it out what a complete fiasco action fraud was. It was just a call centre in Glasgow. Absolutely nothing it sent out was ever investigated. This has now been given to the National Crime Agency. I've no confidence whatsoever the National Crime Agency will be any more effective than action fraud was. A part of the National Crime Agency is the National Economic Crime Centre. It has not, as far as I'm aware, investigated a single fraud. It certainly hasn't prosecuted a single fraud. Its main task seems to be to liaise with banks to see how they can sort it out in the future. And I don't believe that that is going to do much good. The last major fraud to be investigated was the HBOS Reading fraud by Thames Valley Police, of which I was Police and Crime Commissioner. It approached a billion pounds. It was mirrored, I believe, on a far larger scale by other banks. I believe what was going on in Lloyd's and RBS was on a considerably larger scale. One of the problems, I think, with frauds is that no fraud takes place in a single police area. The victim lives in one police area, the perpetrators are in another, the accountants are in another, while the money goes is in another, and so forth. I got severely criticised as, uh, as the Police and Crime Commissioner for acting ultra vares because the frauds were not in my area. But of course, they were covering multiple police areas. And it gives the police a very easy out not to investigate a fraud. And of course, I don't think the police have the capability or capacity or the money to take on a major banking fraud. In fact, the evidence shows that quite clearly. I think much of the, the cover up goes on within the civil service itself. There is a revolving employment door between the senior civil servants and the banks that they should be looking at and the accountancy companies they should be looking at. How many very senior civil servants leave the civil service and just retire? They don't. They go into the financial industry, most of them, those from the, the departments that have dealt with it. Um, I don't th actually think that most senior politicians are inherently corrupt. Maybe I'm being a bit naive about that. What I believe happens is that in yes minister uh, terms, is that when they get ministerial jobs that are involved in this, they go native, and I've seen that. They become over-reliant on the advice they receive from their civil servants, and a great deal is deliberately concealed from them. If I send a letter to a senior politician involved in this today, I know it will not get to him. It will be carefully concealed before it gets there. I believe we are at last making progress, and meetings like this show this but I found it a complete uphill struggle against the establishment for the last eight years or over eight years where I've dealt with this. Um, I said, I think progress is being made at last, but by golly, it is difficult to get the most clear things done. How do you sort it out? Well, it's quite simple to sort it out, I think. What we actually need at a regional level, not a police force level, is proper organizations set up to deal with major fraud. We hold at a regional level serious organised crime and we hold counter-terrorism at, at a regional level. No police force can usually deal with them itself. It needs to be done on a larger basis. I mean, I give you an example of that. The um, business that went on in Salisbury over the Scripple um, and the Russians was investigated, not by Wiltshire Police, so far too small a police force to do it, but it was investigated by Thames Valley which headed up the regional organization to look at counter-terrorism. What we need is an equivalent system to look at major fraud. It's going to need, I think, between 300 and 500 million a year to finance it. 
However, it will be self-financing very, very quickly, I believe. It just needs setting up to start with. It needs a, a separate grant for the police grant from the Treasury to do that, with a proviso that the Treasury has no operational control over it whatsoever, the regional um, organisations that are set up. It does need to be police officers, it needs to be um, accountants and lawyers, with a few police officers to knock on the door in the early morning to arrest the offenders. It would not be difficult to set this up, and I believe until it is set up, and there is a serious desire to set it up, and the serious desire to sort this out, um, we will go on seeing what's happened, what's, what is happening. And I see victims today being dispossessed of their houses frequently on totally bogus insolvency cases against them. People are being made bankrupt on really very minor uh, debt, which they could easily pay off and are simply not being allowed to. And I think uh, Lord Prem Seeker and Kevin Hollingrake are well onto this, that the insolvency service has been taken over completely by those perpetrating the crimes. And there is something very seriously wrong there. And I won't go on any further. I think I've had my five minutes. Um, but there is something seriously rotten within the system at the moment that needs sorting out fairly quickly. Thank you. Uh, Anthony, thank you so much. Let's, let's think of that statement, that final point. There is something seriously rotten in the system that needs sorting out. Let's repeat that. There is something seriously rotten in the system that needs sorting out. What a sentence, what a statement. Bang on, absolutely bang on. There is something seriously rotten in the system that needs sorting out. Let's scream and shout that until something needs, that ha needs to happen starts to happen. Can we please show our appreciation to Anthony Stansfield for squeezing in such, such a rich set of thoughts in such a short period of time for us. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so, so much. We're now going to hear from Taniel Youssef. Uh, we've got to know Taniel quite well over the last six months. And Taniel is going to take the conversation in a slightly different direction. Taniel is going to talk about, well, let me enable Taniel to introduce what she's going to talk about. Taniel, we're a little bit short of time, so as succinctly as possible. Thank you very much. I will do my best. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's actually, it's actually fantastic because everyone in their own way has sort of set me up really well so I can try and be as succinct as possible. Um, the comments that were made by Baroness Me uh, Bennett and Lord Seeker, um, comments made by Shay and Duncan and then uh, just now, I, I'll, I'll briefly sort of touch on the revol revolving door issues, the corruption in government. I'll talk a little bit about the dirty money um, in investments that sort of present cleanly, but um, are actually dirty when you look under the hood. So I'm in Geneva at the moment at the UN uh, for the convention on conventional wep certain conventional weapons. And I'm part of the group of government experts on a, a member of civil society. And I've worked on various um, campaigns, one of them being um, uh, nuclear, non-nuclear -nu proliferation. Actually, Duncan, you mentioned that. Um, and one of the things that that concerns me, but I think that finance um, is a, a force for good here. Um, and again, regulation is a is a, a, a source for um, our quaffers. Um, look at MIFID II and MAR, and, and we're ahead in reg tech there, way ahead of the US actually, um, is the fact that if, and I'll just take one example, uh, we have APPGs on AI, for example. I'm not just concerned about how we fund the big parties. I'm concerned with the companies and the fund managers who actually fund the information that government and civil society get, whether it's um, committees, whether it's all party parliamentary groups that should be fairly independent. Now, we, we at the campaign and various states actually are calling for a ban on fully autonomous weapon systems. And that's not drones because drones have some manned operation, even if it's remote. We're talking about um, algorithms or other sort of sensed data, whether it's radar or heat, which would surveil target and then apply use of force to either take out infrast civilian infrastructure, military infrastructure and target individuals. And I cannot implore em enough, thousands of roboticists and scientists from Stephen Hawking to Elon Musk um, have said this is dangerous, it can't be controlled, it's not predictable, it violates all sorts of international humanitarian law. And from my background, um, from economic law to laws of armed conflict to the work that I do here, 
Um, my experience in disinvestment campaigns is that eventually by a slow sort of degradation through litigation, through PR, through public conscience, through um, the fact that investors eventually see the writing on the wall and take these scrape these things off of their portfolio. I'll just give you two um, brief examples. When the treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons came in, which is not popular amongst nuclear states by any stretch of the imagination, um, my organization won the Nobel Peace Prize for working on that one. Um, I don't take credit for it. Um, uh, of course not. Um, but it was a big deal. Um, the Norwegian pension fund, who you'll all be aware of, instantly stripped all fissionable material and anything to do with nuclear weapons off of its off of its books, because finance um, by anything to do with assistance, and that includes finance, was part of the provision of the treaty. But so did Deutsche Bank which is not known for being ethical. And I like to use that example because we know Deutsche Bank is not known for its ethical portfolio. Um, and I say this because the difference with AI technology here is because it's so often dual use. And when we look at some of the um, fund managers, and I think it was um, uh, Baroness Bennett that said, there are a few hedge funds, hedge funds, excuse me, I'm quite tired, it's late here, hedge funds that sort of you know, run everything. They've got their, their fingers in all the pies. They present quite well, and I've been doing, colleagues and I have been mapping together which companies are working on um, which component technologies and how they're put together. And in the last few days, I've actually been mapping in who's funding them and then who's funding um, research institutions and universities. And a lot of those roboticists don't want their technology to end up in systems that kill. So they might be doing research that cures cancer, or helps clear smoke-filled buildings. They don't want them to target and kill. So they want help with legal coding to say, prevent reverse engineering, to make sure that something's intended uses. But when you look at investment funds, when you look at hedge funds and asset managers, pension funds even, I'm actually looking at, well, what's the overall agenda? And you can look at some of their pages and I'll, I'll be very brief and I'll come off now, but just to give you an idea, you have to become a little bit of an investigative journalist because the stuff, it, it's transparent apparent it's there but you it's only when you get an overall picture because this is dual use component technology when you put it together it becomes an autonomous weapon system um it's not a complete thing that exists and it's built like a robot it's many many component parts and when you look and there's a, a page and it's a uh, company it's called the the you know the Andy company and we want to make your future bright and we're in in health and and future of technology and then you look at well, this one is um, uh, surveillance mapping. This is geo mapping. This is data scraping. This is banking wallets. This is, and you start to get a picture of all the component technology they have together. And you go, ah, this is a picture of the kinds of technologies you would be investing in if you want to have, um, have military applications. And then when you look at on the board of some of those companies, there is a lot of sort of military um, overlap. So it's quite concerning. So I call it not just dirty money, but um, filtered money, Brita filtered money. So what it's sort of, where it starts and where it ends up is really quite concerning. And then the last thing I'd say, because I think this is, it leaks into Shay's area as well. I have friends um, who are very much linked into to what you're doing, especially sort of arms trade treaty work. If we don't ban at the kind of international level, um, that's where you get the sort of rogue applications and the illicit finance. Yeah. And so we implore people like you who, who work with regulators, who work with the raters, who work with hedge fund man managers, who work with those who build their portfolios, because it's the first time in weapons technology history that we can get on the front end of it before it's too late and something's built and we're having sort of back end fiduciary responsibility, litigation, ban something that's already been built sort of conversations. And in this way, we can actually have finance and ethical finance conversations forcing the hand of government in a really good way for once. So I'm sorry I overspoke, but there's, um, I don't know how to simplify that anymore, but thank you so, so much for everything that you've said. It's wonderful, couldn't agree more. And thank you so much for the work that you're doing. It's incredible. That's, that's, that's great, Tanya. Thank you so much. There, there has to be a real worry. Let's show our appreciation, Tanya. Thank you so much. Tanya is a really, really dedicated campaigner for the kind of reforms and transparency that I'm sure we would all really, really want. The big worry I have, ladies and gentlemen, is 
we don't know the answer to this question. The question is how much of the money in British pension savers funds is unknowingly to the pension saver going to fund dodgy activity of all kinds. You know, uh, there isn't enough scrutiny. There isn't enough governance. There isn't enough accountability. The, the regulatory framework isn't strong enough. And because of that, the, 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 the dirty money is flowing around the system to wherever it's going to make the most money. Um, these are real worries. So Taniel has very kindly found a way through her short talk there to relate what's been discussed this evening, the general topic of turning the tide on dirty money into real tangible problems such as, you know, the, the illicit use of technology for, uh, for, for, for uh, um, uh, underhand covert uh, activities. This has been a fantastic masterclass. We really have some, had some outstanding speakers. We're going to wrap up in about five minutes. I'd love to uh, keep it going much, much longer because there's enough content here for going for ages and not more, but we'll have to wrap it up in about five minutes. Please raise your hand or wave something at me if you'd like to make a point before we start bringing the session to a close. And if nobody's going to, I'm going to pick on Mr. Paul Smith. Paul Smith, you're being picked on. I'm picking on you. Paul, please take yourself off mute and tell us a little bit about what on earth you've been doing in the Cayman Islands, sir. Go on, Paul. That's oh, yeah. it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no problem at all. So um, I, I did put a bit, bit of sort of text in the in the speak, but it got a bit disjointed. Um, I was brought in as a consultant to assist the Royal Cayman Islands Police Service to um, set up and run an international money laundering team. Um, strangely enough, uh, a place like the Cayman Islands didn't have an international team. They had a, a, a domestic team, but they didn't have an international team. They, they now have a team. Um, I, I ran it for, for 12 months and was replaced by someone from the um, National Crime Agency, and she's now running the team out there. Um, frightening. So that the money flows through were, were, were interesting and were always out of our grasp. <laughs> um, most of it ended in the States, and the SEC got hold of it before we sort of woke up and, and, and managed to take action. Um, but it was, I, I can't remember who it was that said about um, a lot of the money is not actually offshore. It's just a vehicle for um, the processing and, and for, you know, setting up offshore companies. That's true to a degree. Um, but, you know, there, there are still trillions a year that run through, particularly the Cayman Islands. Um, they're trying to change... They didn't particularly want me out there, but they had to put it up with me um, because, you know, I made a lot of noises. Um, I've left there now, been replaced by someone else. Whether they will revert to type is, is uh, will, will time will tell. But uh, it was a very interesting 12 months, put it that way. Thank you very much indeed for sharing your insights of uh, life and times at the Cayman Islands. Um, wonderful stuff. Uh, Shay, you've got your hand up once again. Your input's been fantastic. It's first class, sir. Thank you very much. Go for it, Shay. Thank you. Uh, um, apologies, but uh, it, it, there's so much of what Paul just said uh, that resonates. This gets into the incentives piece. And I've heard this from many individuals who are really dedicated to do the right thing, but they are kicked out of the organization because... They're deemed a problem. They're deemed, a, you know, a bit of a nuisance and all the rest of it. And, and that's where regulation and, and regulators come in because they need to give uh, individuals who are trying to, do, trying to do the right thing, trying to identify these issues um, uh, and in a way, in, in effect, to save the company itself because uh, it, this is a, it's just a matter of time before, before something gets caught. So I'd just like to pay my homage to Paul that there are many people like him out there who are tossed away at the side as just another cost of doing business. And that is a fundamental problem going, going into my incentive space. Organizations need to be incentivized to make sure that Paul has the right support to make sure that he does, uh, can, you know, he, he continues to do the right thing. Well, well said, sir. Well said. The, the topic of regulatory capture has come up many, many, many times during the various events that TTF has been running. Um, I guess I guess the reality is the amounts of money at stake here 
are so large that it it's a worthwhile investment in um, doing all kinds of things, including you know relatively innocent lobbying all the way to perhaps who knows you know cash in brown envelopes and worse to get the job done to stop people like Paul from snooping around here and there. Thanks, Shay. Thanks, Paul. Uh, the, the final speaker before I wrap up is Anthony Stansfield. Anthony, to you, sir. Thank you. Yes, a, a very quick one which was raised there, which was the business of whistleblowers. In America now, if people whistleblow on a major financial crime, they are actually recompensed and looked after. In this country, we sack them. And the classic case was uh, Sally Masterton, mm -hmm. who was actually not really a real whistleblower. She was commissioned to write a report by Lloyds Bank on what had gone wrong. And when she wrote it, she was sacked. And it took myself and Lord Hollick and others about three years to get her eventually looked after properly and recompensed. But we cannot afford, if people come forward and say something is going wrong, in this country, they are just removed from their jobs without any compensation and without any redress. And that needs to be sorted out amongst other things. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. And I've just read a lovely, lovely, a very, very sweet comment in the chat. I won't read it all out, but Evelyn Stevens says, thank you so much from a person who has no experience whatsoever of financial services, except as a private user of British banks and builder societies. I'm greatly comforted, she says, and inspired that there are people who really know what they are doing, who are keeping track of all these things and trying to change the corrupt systems. Well said, Evelyn. Thank you so much. I think that's a beautiful Beautiful way to close off the night. We really have, I think, personally, I personally think we've been treated to a real masterclass from Lord Premsika, from Baroness Bennett of Manor Castle, from, from Shea Sedanius, from Duncan Haynes, from Anthony Stansfield, and others who've chipped in along the way. Can we please all show appreciation to all of our speakers and thank you ourselves for participating in what I hope has been a worthwhile session for you all. Thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, we'll follow up, we'll circulate the notes, we'll circulate the chat. Uh, there's so much more we can talk about. I plan that we I plan that we're going to be running an event like this maybe once a year. Um, so long as we can keep ourselves afloat financially, and that's a real worry at the moment, by the way, but as long as we can keep ourselves afloat financially, we'll we'll do one of these every year and we can track progress and see how things are going. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for being with us at the Transparency Task Force Symposium about turning the tide on dirty money. Thank you all. Good night. Good night.